I am not the vibrant leaves on the forest floor, Robin Wall Kimmerer writes. I am the woman with the basket, and how I fill it is the question that matters. These words frame the ethical question at the heart of mother and scientist and decorated professor and enrolled member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation, Robin Wall Kimmerer's writings on what she and other indigenous peoples call the honorable harvest. Have any of you read her book or familiar with that idea? Some of you are familiar with the idea and some of her writing. Uh, it's awesome, you should read it if you haven't already. When we rely deeply on other lives, she writes, there is urgency to protect them. The need to resolve the inescapable tension between honoring the life around us and taking it that we must choose in order to live. Kimmerer tells stories of her own journeys into the woods foraging for wild leeks as she describes the guidelines or the principles of this ethical system she's talking about. And this time of year, in wooded areas across the Northeast United States, wild leeks, or some know them as ramps, curl their bright green spears up through the rustling bed of dried brown leaves for just a few weeks, increasingly delighting foragers and upscale farmers markets and restaurants with their strong garlic-like scent and sweet spring onion-like flavor. They have something of a cult following, these wild leeks, and I am a member of that cult. I love the idea of foraging, although my experiences of foraging are mostly limited to picking the in invasive blackberries that grow along the um, abandoned railway hiking paths of Oregon and <laughs> snacking on the wild blueberries that ring the lakes and ponds and um, blanket the mountaintops of my native New England. I don't think I've ever actually tried wild leeks, so the description I gave to you about how they taste comes from the internet. <laughs> but I love to imagine that I am a kind of person who goes foraging for them and then cooks them up. Is anyone actually a forager here? Yeah, okay, Mar Martha, yeah, Martha Coffathorn is, because Martha is my hero in all things. Martha also, I'm sure, knows the wild blueberries of New Hampshire, because that's like a place we share. Um, so at least one of us is it, like is living my fantasy. <laughs> they sound delicious though, right? The black forager Alexis Nicole, who you should also follow on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook if you don't already, um, salts the leaves that she harvests from wild leeks and dries them and then uses them in recipes that she shares year round. So she doesn't just talk about them this time of year, she talks about them all the times of the year when she brings out some of her salted dried ramp leaves. And I think that they sound wonderful on their own. They sound like an amazing condiment to put on everything else. But here's the deal. Wild leeks reproduce really slowly. They don't reach maturity for sometimes up to eight years from, the po from after when their seeds take root. And over-eager foragers have been known to eliminate 100-year growing patches in the blink of an eye. Like other native species that have gained a cult following amongst humans since the colonialists arrived on this land, wild leeks in some places have been uh, what Kimmerer says, uh, calls loved into extinction, loved into extinction. And as I was preparing for this service, I realized that this might be exactly the right week to go foraging for wild leeks around here. So I began to search where I could go within driving distance to dig some up. And after a frustratingly useless round of Googling, I realized that the internet's failure is likely a win for the species, right? <laughs> if it was actually easy to pinpoint all the places within, within driving distance of a massive city where these are, I am sure that these delicious, slow-growing plants would be wiped out in just one season. This is the way that our current Western culture works. It's maybe the way that our Western culture has worked for at least all of the time that it has been on this land. When we discover a precious natural resource, we capitalize on it. We dig it or harvest it or trap it or mine it until it is close to gone. We live in an extraction culture guided by principles of efficiency and productivity that, and there's very little we prize more than plenty and bounty and abundance here. And yet, while there is enormous bounty in our 
agriculture. There are fields golden with grain, supermarkets overflowing with glossy produce. Sometimes we can't still feed, somehow we can't still feed all the people who are hungry, right? Somehow we can't manage t our land to stop topsoil erosion and permanent watershed depletion. Somehow we can't ensure a habitat for the bees and the butterflies and all the other below the radar species that make life possible on this planet. In small and large ways, these are the reasons we need to turn away from extraction culture, turn back towards a replenishment culture. For Kimmerer, this means that when she harvests wild leeks, she will not take them if they are not fully plump and ripe. She leaves them be. She leaves and goes back home with an empty basket. It means that Robin will never take the first or the last specimen of a plant she is looking for out in the woods. Those must be left to seed for the next generation. It means she harvests in a way that supports the plant growth as a whole, harvesting wild leeks from the center of their most dense patches that can reduce the crowding that will inhibit their growth going forward. The canon of indigenous principles that govern this exchange of life for life, this backbone of replenishment culture, is what Kimmerer calls the honorable harvest, what we're talking about today. They are the rules of sorts that govern our taking so that the world is as rich for the seventh generation after us as it is for us. The guidelines are not written down or even consistently spoken of as a whole, she says. They're just reinforced in small acts of daily life. But if you were to list them, they might look something like this, she says. Know the ways of the ones who take care of you so that you may take care of them. Introduce yourself, be accountable, as one who comes asking for life. Ask permission before taking and abide by the answer. Never take the first, never take the last. Take only what you need, take only what is given. Never take more than half, leave some for others. Harvest in a way that minimizes harm, use it respectfully. Never waste what you have taken, share. Give thanks for that which you have been given. Give a gift in reciprocity for that which you have been given. Sustain the ones who sustain you, and the earth will last forever. These guidelines sound like they're written for foraging, but they can guide all of our interactions with the earth, all of our interactions with that which we consume. And they can be found in indigenous cultures around the world and they speak not just to our relationship with non-human species, but with our relationship with each other as well. And they're, honestly, they're not too different from some of the guidelines that can be found in the Hebrew scriptures for any of you who are scholars of the laws of the Hebrew scriptures. Although those, hel those guidelines lean a little bit heavily towards uh, our human relationships with one another. And to be honest, they're not really considered guidelines in the Hebrew scriptures. They're more like laws hounded, handed down from God. But, you know, the message itself is not too different. In Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Exodus and more, there are laws set forth around the management of agricultural lands so that uh, those who are landowners do three things. They allow for gleaning, they tithe, and they lay f allow their fields to lay fallow. So. They allow the edges, you're supposed to allow the edges of your fields to be unharvested and anything that falls on the ground um, to be left so that the poor and those who don't have their own lands can come and glean and get what they need to be able to eat. And you're supposed to give part of what you harvest to the common good each year. And every seventh year, you're supposed to let your fields rest so that the poor and those wild animals will have something to eat as well. In theory, these principles are part of the, um, uh, of the culture that gave birth to uh, us, at least to this church, of the founding culture that we have arisen from, as many others have. And you think that our culture in the United States, which, which loves touting some specific well-chosen Christian principles whenever they're convenient, would retain some of the memory of these practices when about sharing our bounty with our human and animal siblings, letting the land rest on a regular basis. But instead, we choose to maximize 
profits and spray pesticides on just about anything that doesn't serve our bottom line. The main place these principles are still honored are in fishery and wildlife management. In other words, the rules around legal fishing and hunting in this country. So some of you know that my mother has a small cabin on a pond in New Hampshire where I spend a good portion of my study leave every summer. And most days of study leave, I bring my journals and my books down to the dock with a cup of coffee and read, and sometimes I paint my toenails, and sometimes I swim, and I work to plan the upcoming year of our spiritual life together. And on Sunday morning, July 19th of 2020, it was one of those days. I was on study leave, and I had my papers, and I think even brought like a little portable chalice down to the dock. It was a Sunday, so I was planning on worshiping virtually with another congregation. And it was a peaceful morning, it was a beautiful morning, until, until these two fishermen began slowly paddling towards me across the pond. They were somewhere within 10 years of my age, they might have been exactly my age, I'm not sure. They each had their own boat and fishing equipment, and they were talking about things I wasn't interested in. But the acoustics of the pond mean that you could hear just about anything said on or near the water. Have you, any of you experienced that when you're near water? It's like, it's like a well-functioning tech team is <laughs> our natural, natural pods. I got the sense that these two men had left their wives and kids at home to go fishing that morning. And honestly, I'm not much of a hunter or a fisher, and by not much of, I mean I've never done either. <laughs> um, and I mostly viewed, not that I view those things as evil, but I, I viewed these guys as an annoyance that morning. They were a disruption to my peaceful solitude. It was four months into the pandemic, if you remember that time, not long after the most intense weeks of racial justice uprising here, where our separation from one another as humans and our anxiety as a human community were extra high. I don't exactly remember, but I wonder if I fent felt that vague sense of threat with these men nearby that we so often felt in the presence of every other human being at that time. And I was five days pregnant with my first kiddo, Nova, having driven down to the fertility clinic right before going on study leave, as so many queer people do to get pregnant. But I didn't know yet if the pregnancy had taken. It was a time of so much unknowing. Do you remember that time? So much unknowing, so much catastrophe and death and danger, so much hope and opportunity, and for me, literally fertile possibility. It wasn't really too different from any other day as a human on this earth, but every feeling was more heightened, more concentrated at that time. And I was almost so annoyed by these two fishermen's disruption to my peaceful morning that I was gonna pack my things up and go back up into the cabin. But instead, I decided to give it enough time just to paint my toenails and let my toenail paint dry, let the polish dry before ceding my territory. I was trying to really like claim my space. <laughs> and as I painted my toenails, one after another of these men each caught a large bass in the patch of green and purple pickerel weed that was uh, just a few dozen feet from where I sat. They weighed their fish with portable scales, the same kind that my midwife uh, eventually used to weigh my two home birth babies above my own bed. One was four pounds, one was four pounds, eight ounces. The, the, the fish were the, that size. <laughs> My babies were eight pounds, 11 ounces, and 10 pounds, respectively. All pretty big for fish and newborns, surprisingly. And it was exciting. It was so exciting when they caught these big bass. They were thrilled, and I couldn't pretend that I wasn't like the only other person who could hear every word that they could say, and with only, only within a few feet of them. And so I got really excited with them. I asked whether they were going to eat their bass, take them home and eat them. And they said no, that they would just release them back into the pickerel weed. And so I offered to take a picture for one of them. And he called out his cell phone across the water uh, to me so that I could text him this precious record of their morning success. And they gently removed the line, held up their fish, and then returned them back to the water to continue to grow and participate in this pond's delicately balanced ecosystem. I don't know what else they caught that morning, whether they were already at their fishing license determined limit for the day or if they already had enough for their families to eat that night. 
I don't know whether they just prefer to do catch and release, release fishing as their own chance at a socially distanced morning of um, peace and beauty and friendship. But there was an elegance to what they did, paddling noiselessly through the water, catching and releasing the fish that they were not going to eat rather than wasting them or turning them into a trophy or trash. And I imagine that they stopped on the edge of the water as they fished to pick some wild blueberries that day the same as I did. I imagine that they delighted in the sight of the loons with their two babies who were on the pond that year. I imagine that they enjoyed seeing the shiny wet backs of turtles as they jumped from the rocks into the water and that they appreciated the grace of the heron in the marshy side of the pond, just like me. Though I did judge the abandonment of their wives and children at the time, I'm a parent now, and I understand the need for each parent to get a little adult time away, especially thinking back to what they were going through. Those were the early days of the pandemic. Their children probably had nowhere to go outside of their homes, so every parent definitely needed a chance to get away occasionally at that time. It was a time of so much unknowing, so much catastrophe and death and danger, so much hope and opportunity and literal fertile possibility as well, just like today. And I imagined a child who might be beginning to form in my womb. And I made so many promises that week before I knew if this baby was real, if this baby would turn into a real person. I said, I will hike every day that I can while I'm pregnant. I promised this to my future child. I will stay strong, I promised. I will eat vegetables. I will love you, I promise the future. I will work on myself. I will work to make the world a better place. I made so many promises. These are the kind of promises that are just as important for myself and as they were for my future child. To do for the interdependent web of life that holds me every moment as to do for the future. And yet somehow being accountable to another made my resolve stronger that day made the importance of my promises more potent. So much of our extraction culture is based on separation and anxiety that gripped our hearts in those days. Worry that every person might be carrying death to us with every breath. Staying apart being equated with staying safe. Our anxiety that we will not have enough causing us to hoard what we find and disregard the others who are in need the fears of today causing us to forget to make the right choices for next generations tomorrow. As I watched those elegant fishermen practice the honorable harvest, practice a friendship between adult men, miraculous on its own in this culture, practice connection with the grouchy stranger who was painting her toenails on the dock, I watched myself soften and open to the other side of unknowing. Instead of packing up my things and going inside, I learned something about fishing and I learned something about parenting, and I learned something about how to keep our ecosystem sustainable. I warmed up to hope and to opportunity and to the fertile possibility that is arrive in every moment, just as it is today. Know the ways of the ones who take care of you so that you may take care of them. Never take the first, never take the last, take only what you need, take only what is given. Leave some for others. Share. Sustain the ones who sustain you, and this earth will last forever, writes Kimura. She writes that even though she gives a great deal of time and effort to living a life in line with the honorable harvest principles up where she lives close to the land, that what she forages and grows is still not much more than a decoration on the rest of her diet. Like the rest of us, even this woman whose work is transforming our relationship with the earth as a culture, most of her consumption still comes from the grocery store and comes from the wider, normal US economy. None of us can be perfect in this culture at this time, but each of us can take some action within our power to approach what we consume in a mindful and a respectful way. Each of us can choose in unknowing moments of separation and anxiety to instead soften our hearts 
and breathe into the hope and the fertile possibility that is there too. My friends, as you go forth this day, I hope that you might make a promise to yourself and to someone who might hold you accountable, that we might all make the earth a better place for our generation and for all the generations to come. May it be so, and amen. Hi, I'm Reverend Hannah Capaldi. And I'm Reverend Abby Tennis. We are the ministers at the First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia, where our mission is to awaken love and justice in our lives and in the world. We're so grateful that you watched, and we hope that the sermon connected with your soul. We also want to invite you to join us for a live worship service every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You can always find the link to that service on our website at www.philauu.org. In these services, you'll hear words like you've just heard, and you also get a chance to greet one another, pray together, sing together, and we even hold a virtual coffee hour after services to get a chance to greet some new and old friends. If you want to support the mission of this community and you feel moved to give, you can do so by going to the website that Reverend Abby just mentioned. You can find that link below, or you can text 215-709 5095 and follow the prompts to give. If someone in your life needs to hear these words today, we encourage you to share this video. And again, thank you so much for watching. We hope to see you soon.